Certainly for me, without you, I would not have been able to do what I did. I remember those first days in the Richmond Racquet Club with Ron Charity and the others at Brookfield Playground and branching out to the tournament in, in uh, Durham, North Carolina and Washington and Baltimore and Philadelphia, New Jersey and in New York and the ATA Senior Championships in places like Wilberforce and, and Hampton. It was a glorious time. I always maintain that uh, there are two major tennis organizations in this country. One is the USTA, the other one is ATA. I say USTA is number one, ATA is number two. Like Hertz and Avis, one and two is never bad. ATA for me was an, uh, an oasis. It was a place where I could go and meet educated African-American men and women. The ATA has to remain. Founded in 1916, the American Tennis Association is a tennis mecca for African Americans, the oldest continuous African American sports association in the United States, and a powerful testimony to perseverance and the never-ending struggle for equality. African Americans have been playing tennis since the game's beginning in the 19th century. As early as 1898, Reverend W. W. Walker sponsored a tournament in Philadelphia. Edgar Brown was an early pioneer, credited with the creation of topspin and aggressive baseline play. Mother Soames was the first prominent African-American coach, teaching the game on a single court in Chicago. But the tragedy was that in tennis, all white didn't just mean court attire. African-American players were comprehensively overlooked by tennis officials and the lion's share of the press. Excluded from the prestigious venues, events, and media coverage that comprise the American tennis scene, African Americans took charge of their own tennis destiny. In about 1900, uh, the black neighborhood started where these two tennis courts were the backyard of a, a mansion. And so the owner, the white owner, used to let the black neighborhood people come and use the tennis courts in his yard. And so um, upon his death, he had deeded it that they could buy it when he died and separated from the property. So in the early 1900s, that's how the North End Tennis Club came about. Now, Booker T. Washington, in 1890, built what was supposed to be the first tennis courts at a black school at Tuskegee in 1890. He made tennis, you know, the, the game of choice at Tuskegee. The first ATA championship was held in 1917. 39 competitors from 33 clubs, African-American tennis had arrived. The first winners, Tally Holmes and Lucy Diggs Slow. But the ATA's mission went beyond the lines. The ATA's goal was to broaden the reach of tennis, to help young aspiring African-Americans not just become better tennis players, but better people. In the ATA, camaraderie and competition were equal partners, a true democracy of tennis. Barely a decade after the ATA began, a player emerged who helped integrate tennis, Reginald Weir, five times an ATA champion and three-time captain at City College of New York. He was amazing with how fast he could react and his, his readiness, his ability to pick up the ball at the right moment, and was pretty, he was tough to beat. He had sound stroke, he almost beat Gonzalez in, Gonzalez down 5-1. <laughs> and then of course the last set and lost. And he won the 45 uh, senior USTA. So he was a great player. They called him the black Bill Tilden. Now that's that's the height of, you know, Bill Tilden was a dominant figure in the tennis world. And Reginald Ware was considered the black Bill Tilden. So when you ask about him, that's that's the magnitude of uh, Reginald Ware. Many other great players emerged from the ATA. A junior sensation, Lorraine Williams, Ora Washington, Richard Cohen, Richard Hudlin, Billy Davis, George Stewart, Louis Graves, Lloyd Scott, and the incredible sister duo of Margaret and Romania Peters. So dominant a doubles team, they were nicknamed Peak and Repeat. And then there was Jimmy McDaniel, raised in Los Angeles, he taught himself the game by standing in front of a mirror and imitating the strokes of the world's best player of the 30s, 
Don Budge. A crafty left-hander, McDaniel went on to win three straight titles. He was a big man, he had a big service, a big ground strokes and so forth. He was so perfectly coordinated, uh, left hand, back hand, and balls just uh, rocketed off his racket. Amazingly, in 1940, McDaniel played an exhibition against Budge. 3,000 fans jam-packed the stands of Harlem's Cosmopolitan Club. I was uh, uh, selected to be one of the ball boys for that match, and we normally had a one ball boy system or a two ball boy system, but for this match we were asked to use a four ball boy system so that we could uh, have the ball right behind the server at the next position. A lot has been said about how poorly McDaniels played. Well, I didn't get that impression at all. It was that Budge sustained his depth so well and got his first service in almost every time and returned service so well. After all, he was the world champion. He had just come off tour with uh, Ellsworth Vines and succeeded him as world professional champion. Budge won the match, but McDaniel and the ATA scored an even bigger triumph. McDaniel had proved an ATA player could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the world's best. The ATA's credibility was rising. So the Jimmy McDaniel match was critical in that it allowed um, uh, um, this, this kind of interracial competition um, in a sport that was really the privilege of uh, what was only for the privileged classes. Don Budge had proven that he was the best in the world. There was no question. But there was still obviously a lingering thought in the back of his mind that maybe I'm not the best. You know, Joe Lewis was out there, an African American was the best boxer. There was a time when blacks weren't allowed to box. So Don Budge, I think, was saying, well, I need to really know that I'm the best of the best. And I think that's one of the reasons he was very willing to, to, to come to Harlem and play a Jimmy McDaniel, who was the best in the black community. But the spirit of exclusion persisted, denying African Americans equal opportunity. Of course, tennis was not the only sport where African Americans sought equality. In 1947, the national pastime, baseball, was at last integrated with the major league debut of Jackie Robinson. A year later, Oscar Johnson took a small step forward, becoming the first African American to win a USLTA affiliated national championship. Even now, more than half a century later, reflecting on this struggle for acceptance, the ATA stalwarts can only look back on this social injustice with sadness. But I had a couple of guys who committed suicide because they couldn't play, because they were good. You know, they want to play. I want to play. I want to play. I said, well, you can't play, <laughs> you know, and they committed suicide because that's how frustrated people were. We went to one or two USDA tournaments where my sons had been seated one and two, and when we got there, they wanted to know what we were doing there. And I said, I brought my sons and I'm leaving. And I told them the names, and they said, oh, they, they, I'm sure they're not in this draw. So I said, well, let's look at the draw. And it was all there printed. They were there. And then the next thing, uh, a parent came out. After I had gotten, after I had shown them that my son's names were in the draw, the next problem was the person came. She said, oh, I, I heard that the two boys that I'm supposed to keep are here. So... The, the tournament director said, here they are. And this, the lady went whiter than she was, okay? And she said, I'm sorry, I have relatives coming in. I can't possibly do that. I think one time I had entered a tournament and I get, I was a little late. I had to go from Penn Station to Long Island. I called the tournament director, who shall be nameless, uh, uh, told her that I was at Penn Station. I would uh, be late should I come all the way to Long Island and Port Washington and all those places. Uh, she said, come right ahead. I got all the way there, I stepped up, and I went to the desk. She said, you just been defaulted. I know, I really feel that given the full chance, I would have been there. I've been told that. I knew how to play it. The important things about, uh, about the story of the American Tennis Association and black tennis are the scars, the emotional scars that remain with many of the folks who were denied access to a sport that they loved and a sport that, uh, that they were incredibly good at. And I think it's important that, that we 
provide a tribute to those folks because we know what they went through and we, we recognize them uh, for, for what they've accomplished. But the spirit of change was in the air. An ATA player was about to emerge who was going to take not just a small step, but instead would make a big splash. Althea Gibson was born in 1927. She grew up in Harlem, a classic tomboy. Gibson excelled at all sports. Receiving her first racket in 1940, she learned the game from a remarkable instructor named Fred Johnson. He helped me in uh, so many ways. As a matter of fact, he helped me in serving, although he's one arm now. He had uh, lost his left arm up to, his, up to here uh, in, in the war. And so he, what, how he did that, he would hold a ball in his hand and the racket handle at the same time and release the ball and serve. So he taught me my first serve, the overhead serve. And uh, that's how I got started. So precocious was Gibson that two years later, merely 15 years old, she made it all the way to the finals of the ATA National Championships. Upset by the loss, she was consoled by a man who would dare tell her she had the goods to compete at the U.S. Nationals at Forest Hills. His name was Walter Johnson. A physician from Virginia, the man affectionately known as Dr. J, put his heart, soul, and money into the development of African-American tennis players. Each summer, Dr. Johnson invited 10 of the most promising young African-American players to live and train at his house. Dr. Johnson devoted significant attention to sportsmanship. He'd sit down to a nice meal at the end of the day, and um, my granddad would come in and he'd sit at the head of the table, and then it was time for him to talk about strategy and what did you learn today and what did you work on today? Did you work on your weakest stroke? Did you work on that backhand or did you work on the net game that needs work? It was out of his home, his yard, his court, one court in the backyard, and he sponsored them. He put them in his car, took off from his practice, and took these young men and young, young women to look, they looked what the guys played, to the tournament and gave them the proper deportment so that they wouldn't get in trouble. Soon enough, Gibson was given the chance to compete in USLTA events. For much of the 50s, she worked very hard on her tennis, honing her attacking game under the tutelage of Sidney Llewellyn. In 1957, she became the world's very best first taking the singles title at the game's preeminent tournament, Wimbledon. Althea wins the Wimbledon championship, the first member of her race to do so. Later that summer, she won the singles at Forest Hills. She was a champion in anything she did, whether it was football, baseball, stickball, poker, pool, blowing the trumpet, I mean, the trump saxophone, any of that. She was the very best. She was a national hero, pumping interest in tennis, showcasing the power of the ATA, and paving the way for another great champion. Always seeking to advance the cause of young African-American players, Dr. J was fortunate to find a talent right in his own backyard. Arthur Ashe of Richmond, Virginia, had tremendous ambition and the skill to back it up. Arthur came to us at the recommendation of his first coach, Ron Chariot, a local Richmond player who was very talented. His son, Bobby Jr., was actually the trainer of Ash because Doc Johnson had to go to work sometimes to pay the bills. But the real coach, while Doc was taking care of the patients, getting some money to take these young people to the tournaments, uh, was his son, Bobby. His evolution was parallel to the development of the ATA. And upon his shoulders, although he didn't know it, upon his shoulders rested our hope that now we would get recognition from the USDA, recognition from the world. And uh, he was the beginner of our progress. So when I would go to the tournaments to see Arthur Ashe, it was just a white Anglo-Saxon world. And it was so intimidating, but it was like I was going to meet God. It was as close to saying, you know, I'm, I'm here to meet, meet with God. He's here. His name is Arthur Ashe. Ashe soon became one of the world's very best, the first African-American to play Davis Cup. And in 1968, the first African-American man to win a Grand Slam singles title, the U.S. Open at Forest Hills. 
In the true spirit of the ATA, Arthur Ashe was more than an athlete. He was a global ambassador, using tennis as a means toward achieving social change, visiting South Africa, bringing tennis to the inner cities, creating the National Junior Tennis League. In 1975, Ashe reached the pinnacle, winning Wimbledon and upset triumph over defending champion Jimmy Connors that revealed rare emotion and firmly established Ash as the number one tennis player in the world. Gibson and Ash were the trailblazers, and soon enough, many African Americans made an impact on tennis, both as players and coaches, from John Wilkerson, to Benny Sims, to Rodney Harmon, and Malavi Washington, Bonnie Logan, Leslie Allen, and Katrina Adams. Lori McNeil, Zena Garrison, and Chando Rubin. The ATA has been the catalyst for all of this success and reaped the rewards too. In 1972, the ATA championship was televised, featuring Art Carrington and Horace Reed, with commentary of this incredible match from none other than Althea Gibson and Bud Collins. Horace and I played in uh, Boston, and it was nationally televised. It was a five-set match. Um, I never trailed. I never was behind in the match until it was a five. It was a nine-point sudden death tiebreaker. And when Horace won five-four, that five was the first time I was behind in the match. The match was over. Arthur Ashe said that when he was in the locker rooms at uh, Westside Tennis Club, Forest Hills, that the players were all just amazed at the level of tennis and the quality of tennis. And that pretty much brought black tennis because up until that point, black tennis was Arthur Ashe. You understand? And so that kind of brought black tennis uh, uh, of some attention and notoriety that, you know, it hadn't, it hadn't received. And um, that was a pretty major event. Three years later, San Diego hosted the American Tennis Association Championship, the first time it was held west of the Mississippi, and things kicked off in great style with a festive pro-am hosted by tennis lover Bill Cosby, and joined by such luminaries as comedian Richard Pryor and singers Aretha Franklin and Eartha Kitt. Bob Ryland taught many of these celebrities and recalls those days fondly. Well, I taught Bill Cosby, I taught Bob Streisand, I taught Dusty Hoffman, I taught Eartha Kitt, I start Tony Bennett, most all of them, you know. I tried to build cars all over the world, but he didn't want to learn tennis. He wanted to beat me, and he couldn't beat me, so he threw his racket over, <laughs> threw his racket over the fence or wherever, with Vegas, Australia, whatever. They have to buy because <laughs> the guy said, you ain't going to beat me. <laughs> but, <laughs> and Barbara Stry said, she couldn't hit, she couldn't hit, she couldn't hit nothing. She had, she had no reflex. It was one day I was in Midtown Tennis Club, and I had a fellow who I was teaching. He said, I want to play Bob Stryson. So I said, okay, I guess Bob, you want to play. So he did Bob a six love. He wrote her a letter. He said, you'll never be a tennis player. You'll be a singer. And boy, she took her clothes and everything out and went to Florida, I mean, went to California and took up with a bunch of cigars. <laughs> the ATA's luck, impact, and long-standing quest for recognition have made their mark. Following in Gibson's footsteps, America's James Blake was taught to play in Harlem and has emerged as a player of distinction, a Davis Cup stalwart who finished 2006 as one of the top four players in the world. Serena and Venus Williams are international superstars, winning numerous Grand Slam titles, each rising to the number one ranking and featured on dozens of magazine covers and television broadcasts. Breaking ground with every step they take, in 2001, the sisters took on one another in the U.S. Open Final, the first Grand Slam final played in prime time, carried live on CBS, and aired to millions of homes across the globe. Yet as high as these two have soared, each is exceptionally grounded. 2007 marked the 50th anniversary of Althea's great triumph at Forest Hills. Venus Williams truly appreciates the many talents of Althea Gibson. She was amazing. She did everything. She sang, she played golf, she, she just did it all. She was a real true talent and you know the world was really blessed to have her in it. The ATA has been a grand success. As Arthur Ashe titled his book about the history of African-American athletes, it's been a hard road to glory. 
The journey has been difficult and challenging with many ups and downs, but through it all, the ATA has kept its eyes on the prize. Its commitment to communities and recreational tennis always top of mind. I'm a definite believer in community tennis. Whether it's a white community or black community, you don't need to get lost in what color it is. Community is what's really all about. And that's what the ATA was all about. The national organization is just a, is a small reflection of what the local clubs are. Not a big picture. The national organization was a small reflection of what went on in the neighborhoods. And so my life would not be what it is without the ATA. Its ability to nurture juniors are cornerstone, providing aspiring tennis players with valuable life lessons that go far beyond the lines of the court. And most of all, the ATA is about friendship, using tennis as a way to bring people together and form a community. One of the challenges that we have is that young people out there in our urban, especially urban and other communities, don't have access to tennis like other, other communities. One of the interesting things about uh, the ATA and breaking the barriers is that it was as much a, a story about breaking class barriers as it was about breaking racial barriers. It's a critical time in, in tennis history in the black community. Um, many young folks who have a lot of talent don't have the financial means to play the tournaments necessary to get on the radar screen of the USTA. So the ATA plays an important role in helping to groom those students and provide some financial backing so that they can become the champions of the future. From the days of Edgar Brown and Mother Soames on through to Reginald Weir and Ora Washington, Jimmy McDaniel and Dr. Johnson, Althea Gibson and Arthur Ashe, Zena Garrison and James Blake, Venus and Serena, and on into the future. ATA will continue to persevere. It knows no other way. Breaking the barrier. Breaking the barriers. Breaking the barrier. Breaking the barriers. Breaking the barriers. Breaking the barriers. Breaking the barriers.